Hello, and welcome to Mandarin Slang Guide, MSG, the Chinese learning podcast that tastes great and probably isn't all that bad for you. I'm Josh Ogden Davis, bringing you the words and perspectives that aren't in your textbook. The holy grail of understanding any language is understanding its humor, its in-jokes, its wordplay. And Chinese wordplay can be pretty daunting, even to some pretty advanced learners. That's why I was so happy to connect with this week's guest, the writer, translator, and illustrator, Frankie Huang. She has a variety of projects online that really dig into the nature of Chinese wordplay and make it accessible. In this episode, she uses her expertise to just really take us on a journey through some of the most colorful expressions in Chinese, as well as some of the linguistic reasons why Chinese lends itself so well to different kinds of wordplay. Now it's another long one today, so no more introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, Frankie Huang. Hi, Frankie. Welcome to MSG. Thank you for having me, Josh. It's my pleasure. Now, you know that I'm a fan of your work, but could you let the fans at home know kind of what you do? So I run a newsletter called Putong Words, etc. Um, and that came out of a year-long project on Twitter where I ran something that I self-described as a mini column, a daily mini column. Uh, about common Mandarin vocabulary. So what I usually did in the past was I pick a word that we use in everyday language, uh, look at each separate character for uh, their meaning, and then sort of uh, explain to people like the hidden layers of meaning inside these words that people usually don't think about because the word is so old that it evolved over time or simply that... I don't know, simply that. I don't, I don't have a second reason. <laughs> yeah, I really love that newsletter. And actually, I've, I haven't told you this, but I've recommended it in the MSG WeChat yeah, okay. group to try to get more people to sign up for it. Because Aww. you really do do a great job of analyzing not only the characters themselves, but sort of the subtext inherent in these characters mm -hmm. and how they come together to form a specific meaning. It, it's really quite insightful, even for someone like me who uh, flatters himself by calling himself fluent in Mandarin. Even <laughs> even for someone like me, it's, it's, it's very insightful and well-written and, and fun to read. Mm -hmm. But the first time I heard about you was from a BBC article about your illustrations, your double threat. You write... And you draw. Anything that can be done with a pen, you got it. Mm. And the illustrations that they were focusing on were um, some very vivid and whimsical illustrations of really fun Chinese words and expressions. Uh, and when I saw that, I knew I had to get you on MSG. So could you tell me why did you start doing these illustrations? Um, well, I've always liked doodling and, and drawing. So um, this is something that I enjoyed uh, already. But the reason why I started to illustrate certain words as well as um, made up words in Chinese uh, in Mandarin is because there are certain things that are better explained through picture. Um, sometimes the humor is more apparent when it's uh, in graphic form. So uh, for example, I did a set of slang for um, gold thread. <gasps> That's my wheelhouse. Yes, Josh loves slang. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, one of the first ones that I drew was uh, simal, which means um, to inhale cat. And that's a, that's a modern word that describes um, like obsessive uh, cat owners <laughs> that basically you know are addicted to their cats. Like they inhale their cats or snort their cats basically – like it's a line yeah. of whatever, you know, um, and it's just, it's yeah. very vivid. So Simo is literally positioning cat as a drug. Yeah. That's really fun. And I love your illustration of that. Yeah. So um, I actually chose a more family friendly interpretation of that word. So instead of like lines of cats, which is like a little graphic for the children, <laughs> um, I put this little kitty peeking out of a pipe. Yeah. So it would be like, you know, smoking some tobacco, which is still very bad for you. I do not, you know, encourage that, you know. MSG does not condone the use of tobacco <laughs> products. Um, but that's one of the, um, one of many illustrations that I came up with to show, you know, how funny uh, and witty uh, Chinese words can be. Yeah. 
You're such a great explainer. And you recently had a piece in the New York Times about explaining the experience of being in Shanghai during the quarantine. Um, and you, you really do bring out very descriptively, very vividly, these experiences. Was there an experience or a time that that led you to feel like, hey, these are some great Chinese words and more people need to know about these. I need to draw these. Was there a moment when that happened or is it just something you started doing before you realized what you were doing? Um, I think it all started with me wanting to explain things better to people. So I'm Chinese American and um, a lot of my friends don't speak Chinese, but um, Chinese culture and language is such a big part of my identity that there are certain words or concepts that I want people to understand better so that they would understand me better. And I remember one of the first words that I really wanted to explain to people was uh, yuan fen, yuan fen, which is the, the Chinese word for destiny or fate. Mm. So if you look at the characters individually, uh, yuan basically already means uh, destiny or fate. And fen uh, means ration or portion. Mm. So together, it means your portion of destiny or serendipity. So... It is, it's a concept that comes up a lot in Chinese stories and folklore. When two people come together, they would say it's, it's fate. It's like what fate has given us, um, that, that brings us together and allows us, um, often like a certain number of years together. Mm. And then when the years are over, often like the magical wife character would say with tears in her eyes, you know, our uh, rationed destiny is at an end. So I must go. How would you say that? Uh, woman, yuan fen yi jin. So woman is our, yuan fen is, is our portion of destiny. Yi mm -hmm. jin. Is depleted, yes. Mm -hmm. Is depleted, yeah. So yi is yi jin or already. And jin is depleted, yeah. So our, our portion of fate is already used up. Yes, or has ended. Yeah. And this is, I think, something that a lot of um, Chinese people believe in that things happen for a reason and things begin and end because it's meant to. And it's a way for people to sort of accept hard truths in their lives. Um, you know, sort of like, you know, that Catholic prayer about um, accepting things that you cannot change. And mm. I wanted to explain that to some American friends, um, you know, that this is a, this is a concept that we Chinese people, you know, believe in, uh, quite deeply, and there's like all this cultural uh, roots, um, and so that was when I first realized there are all these words that um, already like it's like this tight little package that has all this um, sort of history packed into it. But um, when you translate them, you know, I am also a translator, so if I'm translating yuan mm. fen, uh, I would just call it destiny or fate. Mm. Like you can't explain all these things in like a really long footnote or you know right. in the middle of a paragraph these are just things that like a chinese person would understand and move on but you know in order for a non-chinese person to understand this fully they have to go like read about this word and its history and you know most people don't have time for that so i thought i could be that person for people who are interested. Yeah, and I, I want to dive into that a little bit more. But first, about Yuan Fen, you mentioned that this is a very common thing for people to talk about. And it might seem weird to an American, but this word is used so often. So when people hear that the first time I moved to China, I had never thought about moving to China. And then later, I ended up with a random opportunity to come live here. They always, I would say about 60% of the time, the reaction is something close to, Yuan Fen. Mm, yes. You with China have this portion of destiny. Ni gen zhong guo you yuan fen. And I love that uh, fen can also be um, ration because then you think about, or at least for me, I would imagine some deity with a little scale, like measuring <laughs> it out for you. Like, this is how much you get. This is like, you know, 20 years of China for Josh. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> That's a prediction. You heard it here on MSG. I got I got nine <laughs> years and eleven months left. So let's get cracking. Enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's it was Frankie the whole time. Frankie was the god who's meeting out fate and she just she's her own whistleblower. She she lets slip. There was a leak. <laughs>
So before we dive into these slang expressions, could you share with us a couple of the other just sort of normal words that are everyday words in Chinese that are put together in a way that can seem fantastic to a non-native speaker that you've illustrated very vividly? Um, so there are a few that I haven't illustrated, um, but I would, I've been wanting to illustrate actually. So one of my favorite ones is actually, uh, 脑海, <laughs> the brain ocean. Yeah. I love that one. And that's just when people talk about their thoughts or their imagination. Um, and you know, the illustration would probably be some kind of skull with a, with an ocean inside. And I want to draw like whales and dolphins and you know, ships sailing to the sunset. Like mm-hmm. it's it's almost like a, a Salvador Dali painting, the way I picture it. Yeah. And it's it's so vivid and so full of poetry mm-hmm. that within each of our, our heads is this ocean or even the universe of possibilities, of thoughts. And mm-hmm. you know, we're all creators full of boundless What's the word? Full of boundless uh, possibility. And I think it's it's really beautiful. I'm so glad I got you on the show. This is fantastic. How would you use now high in a sentence? Uh, uh, okay, so my brain ocean, my mental universe, 充满了, is filled to the brim, 充满了, with 幻想, which how would you translate 幻想? Um, fantastical thoughts. Fantastical thoughts. Yes, my brain ocean is filled to the brim with fantasies. Yes. That's so epically poetic. 我的脑海充满了幻想. I love that. Yeah. What else? Got any more? Yeah, sure. Um, another one uh, is a super common word, very useful. Uh, it's 枯燥. 枯燥. I don't know this one. Oh, well. Well, Josh, let me teach you. <laughs> ah. um, so 枯 is dried up, shriveled up plant. Hmm. And then 燥 is like hot and dry. So basically, think of... Um, you know, a, a plant in the in the in the dead of uh, winter, or in the in the middle of a desert. It's like completely dry. It's all brown and brittle. It's falling apart. Mm-hmm. And this word means boring. Oh, it's like something is so boring that it's it's life has entirely drained out of it. Hmm. It's like dry and useless, and completely lifeless, and. It's a, it's of no value to the person regarding it. That's pretty funny because in English we can say that, for example, a lecture was very dry. Yes. Oh, that that, that event was very dry. We say the mm-hmm. same thing, but it doesn't sound nearly as uh, vivid as ku zao. And the thing is, I think for most Chinese people, they don't really think about how vivid these words are because we use them so much. But when I do this project and I really really look at the characters for what they are. Um, it's really fun. It's re- rediscovering my, my mother tongue, basically. So what did you draw for Ku Zhao? Um, well, I haven't done this one yet either, but uh. it would be like um, a bouquet of uh, dried flowers, probably. Mm. So like a very ugly bouquet that you probably don't want to give anyone on Valentine's Day. Yeah. How would we use that in a, in a sense? Like what sort of things would be Ku Zhao? A lecture, a lecture, yeah. So we can say, 那个演讲很枯燥. Uh. Usually, I think it's always, almost always very, it's not, 这个, 这个东西枯燥, it's always 很枯燥. 很枯燥. Yeah. All right. This lecture, very withered. <laughs> yes, withered. That is, yeah. that's a, it's a good uh, translation for... Barren. Yeah. Devoid of life and meaning. Basically, yeah. It's dead. It's dead. Much like this portion of the podcast, not because it's boring, but because it's over. Mm. Thank you for introducing some of your <laughs> some of these. But usually, when I have a guest on MSG, the process is I get in touch with them, we have a brief chat, and somehow we come up with a list of a few words that I think are useful, that they think uh, they can really own, and we can we can share in a useful way. This time, I contacted you about being on the show and i drew up sort of an outline for what it might look like and your response was 
oh, I do lectures about this. This is fine. I'll just I'll just share. I did a lecture. I gave one. I gave one talk. Okay. Um, but I guess it will become lectures now that I've I've be, um, gone onto your show to to talk about this again. Yeah. And with that in mind, I have a brief outline of kind of the words that you're going to get to, but I am brimming with anticipation. My now high <laughs> is chongman la anticipation. <laughs> for what you're going to do right now. So I am I am now stepping back from host role and I'm sitting in the front row of the audience uh, with my pen poised above my paper, mm. ready to take notes. And now Professor Huang will take the stage. Uh, great. So shifting the topic a little bit, mm. I just want to talk about why the Chinese language is so suited for, for puns, for jokes, because it's uh, so easy to make homonyms or homophones mm. in this language. So I'm just going to start by by telling you very quickly uh, some of the different dimensions that Chinese language presents for for play, basically, for, for a Chinese user. Mm-hmm. Um, the oldest Chinese characters are pictographs. So many of these uh, are still used today in simplified and stylized forms. I think most people know about how the fire character looks like a flame or the water one looks like a stream. I mean, those are sort of child play. It, it gets more fun than that. But those like smallest units of Chinese characters often appear as radicals that are part of a, a more complicated character, and they often help inform either the meaning or the pronunciation. So this is a bit like Latin roots, um, for deciphering romance languages, which is something I had to learn when I was taking the SATs um, a million years ago. <laughs> we won't say exactly how many years ago. <laughs> maybe, maybe four. Maybe. <laughs> uh, okay. So there are four tones in Mandarin, nine in Cantonese, uh, which I won't get into today. Oh, please don't. That's horrifying. I, I am only a Mandarin speaker, and I just want to note that in, there are many other dialects that pronounce things very differently and have their own sets of puns and jokes that hopefully someone else can talk about one day. Yeah, I would love to have uh, dialect speakers on the show to share some um, some dialects, especially Cantonese or Sichuanese or something that sort of has a mainstream awareness about it. Yeah. But I've derailed you. I apologize, Professor. Please continue. <laughs> um, yeah. So there are rumored to be 50,000 Chinese characters in existence, 8,000 of which are regularly used. And there are only 400 syllables in in Mandarin when you take away the tones mm. and around 1,300 syllables with the tones included. Hold on. Mm. Let's do that math right quick. So there's four tones and there's 400 phonetic things that we can say like ta, mm-hmm. ba, ka, yeah. these sorts of things. Um, but there's four tones. So it would seem like 400 times four would be 1,200. Why is it 1,300? Do you want to do that math over again, Josh? It seems like it should be 1,600, so why is it 1,300? Thank you, Josh. Some um, some syllables, uh, some syllable and tone combinations don't have any uh, characters attached. I don't really know why, but huh. for example, like duong, the, the word that looks like, Chung, like Jackie Chan's name, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. not a real character. Like there are actually no characters that's pronounced duong, and there are a few of these. Um, which is why we don't have 1,600 syllables available. Like if, if you drew a chart with uh, all of the possible syllables on, on the y-axis and the tones on the x-axis, and you put a dot where all the extant words are, there would be roughly 300 blanks in that chart. Something like that, yeah. Hmm. I, I'm, I'm writing these numbers down. I'm assuming it's going to be on the final? It's, it's going to be an open book quiz. Yes. Okay, please continue, Professor Huang. Okay. So, given that we have so many characters, but so few syllables, this results in a high number of homophones when it comes to single character words. Mm. And a very famous example is a poem about a crazy man who likes to eat stone lions. That does sound pretty crazy. And it's a poem entirely told in characters that sounds like shi, S-H-I but in, in different tones. So mm. um, that's just a really great example of how many characters you can have that basically are all slant rhymes. Can, 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 can you give us a line? Do you have that in the chamber? I don't, I don't have it uh, pulled up in front of me. I have a different one that I can um, recite to you. 
if you want. I would love this. Yeah. So this is um, this is not as famous to foreign listeners as the Stone Lion poem, but it is a tongue twister that people from Beijing frequently use to make fun of non-Beijing people because our Mandarin is supposedly the most standard. Hmm. And uh, it's made up of two sounds, two syllables. Uh, it's 四十四十四十四十四十四十四十 Yeah, this is one that I've, I've, I've tried before. Yeah, so it's basically like four is four, ten is ten, fourteen is fourteen, forty is forty. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's very easy for me um, because... I don't. I don't have an accent. I don't have a dialect uh, other than Mandarin. But for you know, people from many other parts of China, it's a bit of a struggle, especially for certain parts that can't that don't actually separate si and shi in their speech. Oh, and then, yeah. and then, of course, like the Beijinger would be like, "Haha! It's now I get to make fun of you." It's kind of elitist. <laughs> Hegemony through tongue twisters. Yeah. Yeah. When I was living in Guangzhou. I that was back in the day where you could just take a motorbike taxi for, you know, three to 20 RMB to get most places you wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And I got in trouble a few times because I would say when you're haggling, I'd say si. Mm -hmm. And they would think that I had said shi mm. or they would want to pretend after the fact that we had agreed on shi mm. ten when actually I had thought we'd agreed on si mm. four. That's always fun. That's why you should always carry a calculator with you. I never got that hip. I never got that street. That's smart. for people who likes to go to the fake market a lot. I'm not fashionable enough for the fake market. I just buy <laughs> LL Bean once every 15 years, and that's that's how I live. It's, it's very environmental. Yeah. So to summarize, there are roughly 1,300 different unique sounds, unique syllables that you can make in Chinese, but there are 8,000 roughly commonly used characters. So a lot of these characters are going to have exactly the same sound, and a lot more are going to have very similar sounds. And much in the same way that uh, English is a language that lends itself very well to rhyming because of the different word endings that we have, Chinese lends itself very, very well to play with homophones or near homophones just due to that character to pronunciation ratio. Is that right? Yes. Excellent. I'm feeling really confident about this final. Great. Um, Chinese is actually even better for rhyming than English mm. because, again, because we have so few uh, characters that sound exactly the same, but also because a lot of the endings of the characters also sound exactly the same. Like, zhi, chi, shi. Like, you can rhyme all of those mm -hmm. very easily. Yeah. Something that I also wanted to mention is that uh, the Chinese internet can be kind of a scary place for <laughs> the average internet users because yeah. there are, you know, a lot of things can be censored if you say something that is, you know, inappropriate in some way according to the powers that be. Yeah. And uh, I would actually compare the censors to apex predators because they're very powerful, but they're also kind of clumsy or or like <laughs> yeah. ungainly they're not able to be as fast or as nimble as uh, chinese internet users who have all these different tools um given to them by the language to come up with new ways to say things and be sarcastic or or secretive or rebellious without actually you know getting into trouble so mm -hmm. you know the the great firewall which is sort of the the censorship tool mm -hmm. um, in China, it's all uh, software. So in order for things to be banned, I'm not a programmer, but basically uh, they have to ban a very specific word. But there are all these different ways you can say it or refer to it. Mm. And that's why we have such a rich uh, Chinese internet culture where people are basically like habitually always coming up with different interesting ways to say things. Uh, one, because they can, and because it's fun, and two, <laughs> basically for, for survival, so to speak. Yeah, We've talked about this briefly on a previous episode with Avers. We were talking about the word hexie. Mm -hmm. So uh, hexie literally means harmony or harmonious. But if you use it like a verb to say, like, he was harmonized, ta be hexie la. That means that he has been censored. He, the, the powers that be have decided that uh, his voice should be harmonized with a prevailing harmony and therefore must be silenced or modified or, or censored. And since you have a, a music background, I think 
this this metaphor probably speaks to you a lot. Very much. It's um, it's like I I always imagine there's a choir. Uh, and then one person starts singing a note that's not on the page, mm-hmm. and they must be dealt with in some way. They must either be taught the correct note, or they must be prevented from from singing at all. Mm-hmm. And that's how choirs sound good. Um, so choirs are tyrannies. And uh, down with choirs. Down with choirs. No more choirs. <laughs> Noise only. Free sound. Uh, <laughs> and and Avery's brought up one of these uh, one of these homophones. For Hsie, she talked about Hsie, which is river crabs, mm-hmm. which sounds close enough to harmony that people know what you're talking about when you say river crabs. But you can't censor the word river crabs all the time. Then no one could talk about crabs. These yes. delicious little, little little friends. Delicious little friends. Oh my god. Um, and I think we talked about this before. How um, crabs is a really appropriate uh, symbol for referring to censors because um, they've always been a symbol for for tyranny uh, because mm. they're animals that walk horizontally, walk sideways rather than uh, forward like normal creatures do, I suppose. That's that's how the, the metaphor goes. They they break the rules because they can, because it's in their nature. Mm. So they, they stand for um, forces that... Do not that don't do what's right, but do whatever they want. Huh. And so, when the gain of four fell from power at the end of the 1970s, my mother told me uh, all over China people bought crabs and steamed them to celebrate. And they always bought uh, four a set of four crabs, three male crabs and one female crab, which stood huh. for the four members of the gain of four, which was. Uh, one woman and three men. That is fascinating. Protest eating. Not even pro- like celebratory, political celebration eating. I love this. Edible effigy. Yo, you nailed it. Edible effigy. Nice. English has that assonance. Mm. Uh, it's one of our favorite wordplay things. But yeah. let's get back to the Chinese wordplay then. I, I feel like this is always the danger when I'm doing a, an interview for MSG is I want to talk about literally everything. Mm. <laughs> but well, at some point, we have to get back around to stuff that, that people will, can use in their in their conversations. Sure. Uh, so, yes. Sorry. I, I've picked up my pen. I am ready to continue taking notes, Professor Huang. Mm. Sure. My last point is for for Chinese people... They not only have this very versatile language they can play with, but also thousands of years of previous usage and references that people can tap into. So as long as it's a it's a reference that is common and, you know, that it's something other people will understand, it's game. So unlike, I think, Western, uh, well, I'm, I'm only really familiar with American pop culture, but oftentimes new references are just new, whereas in China... Uh, sometimes you'll get a reference that's thousands of years old and it flies. So um, actually, I, I'm, I'm going to get into uh, a few examples of these references. And the first one is actually a circle reference. Okay. A couple summers ago, uh, there was this really popular reality show called Produce 101. Huh. And it's a, it's a talent reality show that featured a legion of young women that are all competing for a place in an all girls uh, sort of super pop group modeled after um, K pop pop groups. Mm-hmm. And uh, one contestant really stood out by defying conventional Chinese standards of beauty and demure femininity and earned herself a rabid fan community. Mm. And so this celebrity's name is Wang Ju. Wang Ju. Yes, so Wang is a very popular surname, and Ju is the character for. Uh, chrysanthemum flowers mm. and this is a flower that uh, stands for defiance mm. and strength in the face of opposition and that just happens to be her natural name is, and, is, and is Wang Ju. yes and so that's her natural name and also really fits her personality and her fan community call themselves um, by the name of a, a Jin dynasty poet Tao Yuanming Tao Yuanming. Tao, Tao Yuanming, second tone. Oh, sorry. Tao Yuanming. Yeah. Tao Yuanming. Um, so this is a very uh, old reference, but it's a, it comes from a poem that I think a lot of people study um, either in middle school or in high school. Mm-hmm. And a Song Dynasty Confucian philosopher wrote an essay called Ode to Lotus. And in that essay, he references 
Tao Yuanming, the the Jin Dynasty poet, saying that Tao Yuanming only loves chrysanthemum、hmm. because、um, he loves these flowers for the their spirit. So the fans basically call themselves by the name of this poet because this poet was arguably like sort of the OG. Um, fan of <laughs> of the flower precog fandoms exactly.、Um, so basically, rather than simply referring to themselves as as Wangju fans, they chose a reference that's hundreds of years old in order to enhance their support for their favorite idol. And it's really cool、um, that they would just casually refer to to classic literature. Yeah. So that it's it's sort of like a, a step beyond some kind of wordplay on Wangju's name,、uh. which is I think something that Western、uh, fandoms tend to do. Like I think Benedict Cumberbatch's fans call themselves Cumber Bitches, <laughs> and that's sort of like. And if they don't, they should. Yeah. So that's like as much as you can really do、uh-huh. um, in terms of、uh, not as much as you can do, but、mm. this is that's often what people do in. English-speaking fandom, but、yeah. in China you have sort of a lot more room to play, and that's something that is very deeply tied up in the language. And this is something I think about a lot because in English, what we're left with is the letters.、Mm-hmm. When we write, we're basically indicating pronunciation. But in Chinese, the characters have so much more information in them. Where Cumberbatch, this. Collection of phonemes has a meaning that came from somewhere. I have no idea what it is. It's a batch of cumbers. <laughs> what?、Um, but Wang Ju's name for Chinese, you cannot remove the etymology from the word. There's no sound that you can make in Chinese that's not attached to a character, and that character has a history. And you can look at Wang Ju and know that that is a flower. So because you write in characters, you put a lot more information into these names, and that opens up a lot more room. For references, whereas Cumberbatch is just a sound,、mm-hmm. so you got to find something that sounds similar and stick it on there, and that's that's a big part of what we got to go with.、Mm-hmm. So for my next example,、um, it's a pun, and it draws on、uh, a long tradition of using homophones to add or rather layer meaning、uh, on top of words or symbols.、Mm-hmm. And、um, a more traditional example is how it's very unlucky to. Cut a pear in half at a family gathering because、huh. 分离、oh. like to split a pear.、Uh, it sounds exactly like 分离、uh, with a different character at the end, which means to be split apart. Basically, for for family to be、uh, ripped in half or displaced, and it's very unlucky because you want you want、um, your family to be together. Yeah, so I'll break this down. A 离子 Is a pair, so fun can be to separate. So to to split a pair is fun li, but also fun li would mean to split. And li is the, the li that means distance here, right? Like the same li that's in ge li that we talked about. Yeah. So either distance or to depart. Oh, right, right, right. Like li kai、mm-hmm. to leave to depart.、Mm-hmm. Okay, so I continue. Right. This sort of. Uh, guides a lot of、uh, sort of traditional behavior. It's not quite superstition, but it's this sort of symbolic, ritualistic behavior that carries a meaning. So, keeping with that tradition of like layering homophones together and connecting the meanings,、uh, a more modern example is when professors 教授、mm. is written with、uh, different characters that also sound the same. It's still 教授 but instead of The teaching givers, as the as the original characters are for for professors, it's now、mm-hmm. the howling beasts. Jiao,、oh. as in to cry or to shout or to howl, and shou,、mm-hmm. as in as in beast or brute.、Mm. And this is a this is a pun that came about partially, I think, because there were professors that were being caught abusing their female students. So internet. Uh, users came up with this pun to basically call them out for what they are, which is less than human. And that contrast with professor is quite stark because traditionally educators are seen as、uh, top elite members of society, and they sort of are the the standard bearers for moral behavior. They're supposed to be the most pure and most righteous. And they're supposed to show everyone else how to be good humans,、mm-hmm. but 
in reality, they're monsters taking advantage of their positions. So, so how would you、mm-hmm. use Jiao Shou? Would you say like he is a Jiao Shou? No. So, so Jiao Shou is usually used as a. What do you call it when you just? It's like Professor Wang. Ah,、oh. uh, Wang Jiao Shou is how you. How you use it? So honorific is that is that what it is? An honorific or a title? Yeah. So they would just swap it out. So instead of Professor Wong, it would be Crying Beast Wong. So you would just to to indicate that you know this person is up to that, you would just switch out those characters. Right. Or it's simply used exactly as how you would use Professor. So、right. like. I don't like listening to this professor talk. You could, you'll just swap it in. It'll sound exactly the same. But if you're writing it out on the internet,、mm. um, people will see that you're actually being quite rude about it. Yeah. So that sentence you just said, "I don't like listening to this professor talk." I don't like listening to this professor talk. Jiao Shou, howling beast, <laughs> and then Jiang Ke, or to give a lecture or to to give a class. So, 我不喜欢听这个教授讲课 I don't like listening to this professor or howling beast give class. And speaking, it's it's identical, but writing you can substitute those two characters for howling beast in there.、Mm-hmm. Hi, it's Josh from the editing room. I just want to tell you the sound quality is about to go way down, but it's not my fault. It's Skype. It dropped our call five or six times, and eventually we just gave up and switched to a normal phone call, and that created a whole other set of difficulties that we could have prepared for ahead of time if we hadn't trusted Skype so much. Hashtag mistake. So don't trust Skype, but do deeply enjoy the rest of the show, which is starting now. N- no wait, now, now, no wait. I think it's going to happen pretty. Soon. All right. So the next example is very dear to my heart.、Uh, it is Rice Bunny, which is the Chinese symbol for the Me Too movement. And the case of Me Too in China is a very special one because I think it's the first、uh, meme, I guess. That I observed to have originated from overseas and took on a Chinese form, and it's a very powerful global feminist movement. So it makes total sense for it to find its footing in China and take on Chinese characteristics.、Hmm. Um, this is also a great look at how a non-Chinese idea is given a fighting chance in the very dangerous landscape of the Chinese internet, because the Chinese feminist movement is something that the government. Feels very threatened by for any different reasons.、Uh, could you elaborate on a couple of them? Because I, I, I actually find myself not knowing what they are.、Um, so basically,、um, women, even though for a while we're called,、uh, well, Chairman Mao has this famous quote.、Uh, whether or not he actually said it, you know, who knows? <laughs> But it's that women hold up half the sky. And that on the surface, this is a a feminist or or maybe not a feminist statement per se, but it's definitely advocacy for gender equality, which is something Chinese society didn't have, and that was supposed to be part of what the Chinese Communist Party brought for the people that they've so-called liberated, that they're going to、mm-hmm. live in a modern society where women are not oppressed simply for being women. Mm-hmm. But the reality is, mindsets are hard to change, and women were always viewed as a tool for, you know, either labor or production, as in production of babies. So women、uh, joined the workforce in China in great numbers in the 60s and 70s. I think at one point reaching as high as 97 percent, as in 97 percent of all Chinese women. Were working rather than、um, staying at home, and that number has slipped quite a bit in、mm. recent years. I can't give you the number off the top of my head,、mm. but fertility is the other aspect of women that the government sees as something that they should control because fertility is tied to the labor force, and you know when there's population aging. Then it's up to the women to have more babies, so that、yeah. there are more young people working, making money, you know, paying taxes and propping this country up. So basically, feminism 
as the Chinese government has defined it, is is kind of a sham. And so the Me Too movement directly challenges the way women is oppressed and mistreated by men. And that's something that also challenges the government's attitude towards how women should behave. So that's why Mm -hmm. this is something that gets censored. This is why um, I think in 2015, 14 or 15, there was that very big incident of the Feminist Five, uh, a group of feminist activists being imprisoned for uh, over a month, uh, drawing international outcries for the government to release them. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so this is why when, when Me Too came to China, uh, it became censored very, very quickly. Mm. Both Me Too, the English letters, and the Chinese translation, 我也是, so oh. um, the 我 as in me or I, 也 also um, is. So literal translation of Me Too. These yeah. were both censored on Chinese internet. You, you were not allowed to use those hashtags on Weibo. Um, articles were getting deleted. Um, mm. So it took on a new Chinese name, uh, Me Too, which is a, a phonetic translation of Me Too. Mm-hmm. And the characters that were selected are Rice Bunny, um, <laughs> me as in rice, and then Tu as in rabbit, but bunny is cuter, which is why um, I call it that. And I did a little bit of analysis on how Rice Bunny was chosen out of hmm. uh, all the other possibilities. So a little bit of math. Mm-hmm. Um, there are 97 characters um, for the sound me or M-I for right. 18. And that's, that's of any tone, right? Like me, 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 right? Yes, any okay. tone. And then 34 characters for tu. Tu, 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 tu. And that gives us uh, 3,298 possible unique combinations. That's a lot of unique possible combinations. Yes, but most of them are ridiculous or like <laughs> doesn't have any meaning. Yeah. Um, but if we only look at commonly used characters, um, I came up with 16 me's and 19 twos. Mm-hmm. And that still gives us 304 possible unique combinations. That's still quite a few. Yeah. So this is my personal interpretation, but I think Rice Bunny was chosen specifically because it suits the movement best. So I want to look at the character Rabbit first. Um, It is a zodiac animal, kind of equivalent to an astrological sign. Mm -hmm. And I won't get into all the things that it represents, but Rabbit is definitely a symbol uh, that represents uh, the feminine. Mm. So, for example, Quick example, there's a, the rabbit in the moon is a, is a female companion to the moon goddess. So hmm. um, the moon is also a feminine astrological symbol um, opposite to the sun, which is traditionally more masculine. Yeah. And so when we look at rice, it is a very uh, balanced character, perfectly balanced from, from all sides, symmetrical. Yeah. Um, and to me, it looks like a compass which is a tool that guides people in need of direction. Mm-hmm. Um, also, rice itself is, in my opinion, considered one of the most basic and universal parts of Chinese diet and Chinese life. Mm-hmm. And it's abundance that represents um, a good, fulfilled life because you're fed um, and you're, you're content. So when you look at these two things together, rice bunny, to me, it's a word about feminine individuals that stand for a universal a universal necessity fundamental to every Chinese individual. That was an incredibly in-depth analysis. I always thought it was because the idea of a rice bunny was one of the cutest things. And so obviously we're going to choose this one. It's super cute. It's super cute. But I think beneath all that cuteness, there's also all this symbolism that enriches its meaning. And I think mm. it's a very appropriate symbol for the movement because not only um, is it very likable and appealing, but it also represents something very true. And I love that beneath this like deceptively humble and uh, adorable representation, uh, it's in fact a rallying cry for every woman to demand what she deserves. So how would you use it in a sentence? What sort of sentence would have me too in it? Um, it's just when you're talking about um, the movement, basically. So, uh, mm. Yeah, I, I support the rice bunny movement. Yeah. 
我米支持 support me too me too. 运动，运动 is an interesting word because I think everyone learns it to mean sports.、Mm -hmm. That's the when you learn it in your first year, second year Chinese class, you say sports is 运动 but it also means、mm -hmm. movement in general, also in the political sense. So 米兔、yes. 运动 is the Me Too movement. 我支持米兔运动 I support the Me Too movement. Yep. We have one more, and we've we've talked for quite a while, and I. Hate to rush anything because this is all fascinating to me, and so I'm betting it's fascinating to our listeners as well. But you've put one more expression that honestly is some of my favorite drawings of yours are based off this expression. You know what I'm talking about? The sad squid. The sad squid. He's such a sad little squid. You just want to、mm. hug him. <laughs> and you know, squids are good at hugging. They got so many arms. Oh man, that's actually a very creepy and disturbing image. Thank you for that. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> Sorry. So, 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 what is this sad squid? What are we talking about? Why is sad squid a thing? So, you know, I I spend so much time thinking about the way people play with Chinese language.、Um, it's pretty inevitable that eventually I would decide to try it out. And a few months ago,、um, last year actually, I was playing around with the characters、uh, Yu Yu, which means. Melancholy or depression,、mm. and I, I realized that there are all these other words that also has the same syllables if you take the tones away. So、yeah. I came up with a list of six,、uh -huh. and I need to look it up because I want to. I am waiting with bated breath. Can I put my phone down for a second? Yes.、Okay. Yes. Oh, she put her phone down. We're off the. She's off the podcast. She's done. Terminated. Gone. Erased, eradicated. I'm still here. All right, I'm back. I'm back. Yeah, so this is actually from last October. I came up with a list.、Uh, so I'm gonna read the six、uh, different words to you, and it's 忧郁忧郁忧郁忧郁忧郁,忧郁,忧郁 and 忧郁 I knew maybe four of those. So in the same order. It was melancholy, hesitation, because squid, having surplus, and better than six very common words. It was getting dangerously close to a grammatical sentence. It's not. <laughs> But it wasn't. It was just a list of okay. <laughs> I was like, whoa,、yeah. this, this rabbit hole goes deep.、Um, we tried to make a few sentences with them. Actually, people wrote some very interesting poems. Like、hmm. here, this there's this one. 忧郁，忧郁，忧郁，忧郁，忧郁，忧郁，忧郁，忧郁，忧郁，忧郁，忧郁，忧郁，忧郁，忧郁。So this is from one of my readers, and this translates to ready. Because of the rain, <laughs> there are some fish swimming among the squids. A particular squid is hesitant because some fish、uh, are feeling superior to the squid. This makes the squid more than a little melancholy. That's pretty long. I'm not. I'm not gonna. Well, now let's break this down character by character. Yo, you. No, no,、mm. we're not gonna do that.、Um, here, let me do one that I wrote, which is easier. I wrote yo yu yo yu the yo yu yo yu. I yo yu them, and then the translation is because of the surplus of hesitant squid, I became depressed. Can I stop speaking Chinese now? That seems like the, there's an awful lot going on there that I will never be able to parse. <laughs> I mean, nobody nobody speaks like this. This is one of those cases where you have to read it on the page.、Um, when people、right. speak with this many homophones, they're not trying to help you understand what they're trying to say. They're trying to confuse you, and nobody talks like this in real life. So this should not like cause anyone to. Freak out about learning Chinese because this is for fun. This is not everyday conversation material. Excellent. Well, I will now resume speaking Chinese. <laughs> It feels safe again. Great. So, out of those six words, I took、uh, "you you" for melancholy and "you you," which is squid, and put them together. And I also really like alliteration in English. So instead of calling it the The melancholy squid. I called it the sad squid, and it became this、sad、little、squid. character that I draw sad comics about. And it's just like a, a very, a very relatable little creature. A little bit shy, very neurotic.、Yeah. He just 
He's adorable. Always needs a hug. He does, and he would be so good at it, but no one ever hugs this darn squid. Nobody wants to hug him. He is too slimy. I do, but I can't swim. <laughs> uh, so I want to let everybody know where they can go to find more sad squid and other things as well. But before we do that, um, let's blaze through some of the words that we've talked about okay. so people can sort of refresh them in their memory and then we'll let everybody know where they can go to get more Frankie Huang and her whimsical fantasies. Woo. So the first one that we talked about a lot was fans of, was it Wang Ju? Yes. So Ju is, is a flower that is known for its resilience and so her fans call themselves Tao Yuan Ming. Tao Yuan Ming, which is a, a, an ancient poet who also loved this flower. Yes. For professors who have been known to take sexual advantage of students, which apparently this happens enough that there's a whole word for it, which is horrifying in and of itself. But the word for professor is jiao shou, which means teaching giver. But uh, we change that to a different jiao shou, which means... Howling beast. Howling beast. Very evocative. Which you've also drawn, by the way, and it's a very creepy illustration. You really captured the creepiness of that incredibly well. Thank you. Moving on to something a little bit better, we're talking about the Me Too movement, which is uh, Rice Bunny. Rice Bunny, Me Too, or Me Too Yun Dong, Me Too movement. And at the very end, we talked about a lot of homophones and near homophones on uh, Yo Yu, and we have a sad squid, which is called Yo Yu Yo Yu. Yo you yo you, yes, excellent. So, if you guys want to see how Frankie has illustrated these things, and possibly even get a print for yourself, I've noticed that that's something that is available. Mm -hmm. uh, where should they find you? They can find me on Instagram at Putong Words. That's my Instagram handle: P U T O N G W O R D S. Putong Words. Um, or they can find me on Twitter. My handle is kind of weird. I'll put it in the show notes. It's impossible to spell. It's yeah. O-U-R-O-B-O-R-O-R-O-B-O-R-U-O. -O -O -O. It's Ouroboros as a palindrome because I want it to somehow eat itself uh, in this form. This is the vivid fantasy that happens in Frankie Huang's Nao Hai, mm -hmm. her brain ocean, <laughs> all the time, which is all the more reason why you should check out her stuff. And we've been going for quite a while now. I think we're going to let the fans go. But thank you so much, Frankie, for taking all this time to talk with us. It was my pleasure. That's all the MSG we have for you today. If you want some more, or if you want some flashcards to help you remember these great words, or if you just want to join our WeChat group, add our WeChat at MSG Podcast, all one word lowercase. Or get on Facebook or Twitter and just search for Mandarin Slang Guide. If you want to see Frankie's work or get a print of her work for yourself, check out her contact info in the show notes. Thanks again to Frankie Huang for fighting the good fight with me against Skype. Thanks to Himalaya, as always, for being a great place not only to listen to podcasts, but also to host your podcast for free. Himalaya, get it into your now high! A very special thank you this week to everyone who has ever hugged a yo yu yo yu. I bet there aren't that many of you, but you're doing great work out there. And last but not least, thanks to you, the listener, for listening. I love it when you listen to this podcast. So keep in touch and 再见, 再会, 再聊. Bye bye.